Okay, so welcome everybody to the final in our series of CatFest web webinars this academic year. These webinars are organised by the CatFest Networking Project, which is based in the Department of Sociology at the University of Surrey. Uh, I'm Christina Silva and I'm joined today by my colleague uh, Sarah Bullock. As we're nearing the end of the academic year, we're in full flow organising an exciting programme of webinars and training events for September onwards. So do keep an eye on our website and social media channels uh, for information once they're scheduled. Uh, also, if you're interested in contributing to our webinar series, please do get in touch. Sarah and I would love to hear from you uh, and especially looking for uh, webinars from users, uh, which is what we've got today, uh, which is what I'm just about to tell you all about. So uh, as I mentioned, it's our 18th and final uh, webinar of this academic year. And it's the fifth in our user stream when we invite researchers, teachers and students who are using CACBAS packages in their work to share their experiences with us. And there's no better way to conclude our series this year than with today's webinar with Kate Fugazola, who is going to speak to us about software assisted digital ethnography and social media analysis. We're really delighted to welcome you, uh, Kate, today. Uh, Kate is an Earl S. Johnson instructor in sociology uh, in the Master of Arts program in the social sciences at the University of Chicago in the United States, uh, although today she's joining us from Italy. Uh, Kate's research interests are broad, spanning substantive topics including social movements, gender and sexuality studies, and transnational sociology. And she also has a keen interest in and experience with using and teaching qualitative research methods, particularly rhetorical and discourse analysis. She's a certified trainer of Max QDA, which is one of the pioneer CACDAS packages, and she trains researchers in its use with a clear methods focus. Kate gained her PhD a couple of years ago from the University of Chicago, and she's currently writing a book arising from her dissertation research, which examines strategies for social change in authoritarian contexts. But today, Kate is speaking to us about how qualitative software like Max QDA can be used to facilitate digital ethnography and social media analysis. And that's, of course, become an increasingly important topic over the past 18 months or so. But actually, Kate's been working in the field of digital ethnography and online research more generally before the pan pandemic started. And she's going to share with us some of her insights regarding methods, social media sites as sources of data, and techniques of analysis supported by software tools. Whilst she's speaking, please do feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat function of this Zoom meeting, and we'll collate them and Sarah uh, is going to uh, pose the questions uh, to Kate when she's finished her presentation. So without any further ado, Kate, uh, over to you and thanks for being here. All right, I think I've succeeded in unmuting myself and sharing. So hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me here at this sequence of webinars. Um, I'm very excited about here about being here. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about a topic that has been on my mind for a long time now, and both as a researcher and as a teacher. Um, so throughout my doctoral studies, as you mentioned, I have found myself in this strange position um, of having been trained in classic ethnographic methods. Um, and I use the term in quotes for reasons that I will explain in a minute. Um, and then finding myself looking at a field that included both the physical and the online work. So and then during the past year, I've witnessed ethnographically oriented students and researchers having such generative conversations about the state of the field um, and the possibilities and challenges of online research and particularly the tools that might help ethnographers as they navigate these very uncertain times. So I am going to start with the question that plagues a lot of ethnographers nowadays uh, and it's the one that I am asked a lot um, and I had to think about the answer to that. What exactly is digital ethnography? Um, and you may have heard this with other names, so other researchers may call it virtual ethnography, cyber ethnography, net ethnography, online ethnography, any of those works. I do like digital ethnography. I think it has a nice ring to it. Uh, but if you encounter it under any other names, that's the thing that we're talking about. Um, and what the hell is this? Uh, is it different than regular ethnography? Is it 
a subset of it. It's a new thing that came with the pandemic and might go away um, as in-person research becomes possible. I think the easiest one is the last one um, because the answer is no. Um, no, I don't think it's going away, but also no, digital ethnography is not new. Um, it's pretty much as old as the internet, which I will grant you um, is not very old, but also not very young, which is a definition that I particularly identify with. Um, so I think it's here to stay. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn from things that happened before it became the thing for ethnographers during a pandemic. Um, as to what it is, it's a methodological approach to the study of virtual spaces, um, cultures, and communities. Uh, and as the name suggests, uh, it's not just any methodological approach, but it's an ethnographic approach. Um, and as such, it involves participant observation. Um, it involves the study of everyday life as individuals experience it. And it involves a particular focus on cultural practice. So when I use air quotes to say that I was trained in classic ethnography, here's what I mean. I think that distinctions between ethnographic work in the virtual versus the physical words are pretty counterproductive um, because methodologically speaking, we're still dealing with ethnographic practice. And we have, I think, more to lose than to gain from creating these dichotomies. Um, that said, I will probably be falling into the trap of using this dichotomy, so feel free to call me out on it whenever I do it. Um, I am, there is one that I'm particularly aware of, and it's, it's a very tempting dichotomy that juxtaposes the virtual and the real. Um, and I think this year has proven that this is wrong, right? And it's 2021, we're in the midst of a pandemic. It has forced us to mediate most of our social interactions through a screen. And I don't think at this point there's any doubt about how silly it is to see, to say that virtual spaces are, are less real than physical ones, right? And I say this as I am talking to you through a screen. Um, I personally don't think this makes our interaction any less real than it would if I was standing in front of you in a room. So I think we've proven that real social interaction take place um, in virtual worlds and that we can study them um, ethnographically. So this brings me to virtual worlds. What are virtual worlds and what forms of participation are possible in these worlds? Um, and for the purpose of this webinar, what kinds of analysis do these virtual worlds invite? Um, so for the definition, I am going to borrow one from a book that I deeply, deeply love and that I have used extensively in my classes, the book being Ethnography and Virtual Words. And it's a, it's a four-part definition. Um, so the first thing to know is that virtual words are places and they have a sense of wordness. Um, so if you think of you open a web page and you feel like you're going someplace, um, you're not simply opening something that is part of a bigger whole, it's a place. It has like some boundaries that you can kind of define and it feels like you're stepping into a different world. When you open a different website, a different page, you're stepping somewhere else. Um, and the reason why you're able to see this wordness happening is also because there's people. So the second point is that virtual words are multi-user in nature. Um, you're not alone in the virtual world. So if you're thinking of something like a single player video game, that is not a multi-user experience. That's just you, and it invites a different kind of analysis and a different kind of approach. So you can do fantastic work on design, you can find fantastic work on user experience, but for an ethnography, you need other people. Um, otherwise, it's very hard to see culture happen in interaction. Um, and you need people to talk to each other, right? You need synchronous communication and interaction to, for that to be a virtual word. For my students, I actually have a caveat because I think that Synchronous communication is great, but there are awesome opportunities in communication that is semi-synchronous. So if you think of a forum where people can post and reply to each other maybe after a few days, um, I think that would still count. But I mean, the debate is open. Um, the third thing about virtual words is that they are persistent. So again, with the analogy of the single player game, if you stop playing and then you start again after a year, you're still in the same place where you left things. So that wouldn't be a persistent word. Um, a persistent word is one where if you log off, things keep happening because there's people in there. So conversations change as you're not logged in. Um, the landscape may change and things happen. Like life keeps happening without the researcher being logged in. The fourth and last one is that virtual words need to allow participants to embody themselves. And this is a tricky one because in the Example of a multiplayer video game or anything that has avatars, that's easy to visualize, right? How do you embody yourself online? You create a character, 
you pick up characteristics and then that's that's you you have a you that's virtual but then if you translate that to something like instagram for example what does it mean to embody yourself in a, on, on a platform like instagram um so that is something that i urge my students to think about and i keep thinking about what does embodiment look like when the platform is photo based or when the platform is text based um, and here the authors of this book talk about textual avatars, which I think is a fascinating concept. So in terms of a few examples of virtual worlds that lend themselves quite well to ethnographic approaches, um, one is to mention multiplayer games. Those are great because you actually have kind of a reproduction of, of a physical word sometimes, and maybe a fantasy word, but you have people moving in. Um, but then if you go past that, you can think of fandoms as virtual worlds. Uh, and in general, online communities that converge over shared interests broadly defined, all of those combine to create a virtual world. So even like a Facebook group um, could fit the definition of a virtual world. And in fact, social media sites are an obvious choice for a potential field site for a digital ethnographer. And that's because on social media sites, individuals find each other and communities come together um, on these sites. And these include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, a lot of others. Um, and the process of identifying a field site may seem daunting when all these communities are, are quite literally in our pockets or at least a few clicks away. Um, but still, this daunting moment is something that is pretty familiar for like, to ethnographers of all kinds. And selecting a field site is strictly connected to the social phenomenon that a researcher wants to study. So let's say that I want to study, as was my actual case uh, for my research, um, LGBT groups operating in the People's Republic of China. So what I asked myself when I was trying to figure out what the digital field looked like, I asked myself, where are these groups active? Um, what kind of online presence do they have? How do they define the boundaries of, the com of their community? And then I asked what cultural and social practices signify belonging in those spaces. Um, and in my case, after looking around, I landed on WeChat. Um, and this is a social app that it turned out it combined the option of the private one-on-one -on -one interaction between users like on whatsapp but then it was also on a platform built for public accounts so groups were using this to sponsor events to publish articles to promote visibility and to collect donations so i found that there was a lot of word building that was happening on this app and then as i was preparing myself to enter a number of things um immediately like the this thinking brought to this to the for, to the to the surface um, some questions that eventually I would find myself asking my students a few years down the line, um, and these questions included how how I want to say here this is my field, and I can't say well it's a school you know it has walls or it's a park or you know it's it's a sports community, this is online so how do I tell people what the boundaries are, and then I had to ask in the field because the field was in my pocket and it was available whenever I wanted to open my phone. Um, and then I also had to ask myself what kind of identities I was observing and what kind of identities I was embodying. And all the as they enter any field, um, but there are some peculiarities that make the virtual world both more and less challenging than a physical field. And the first obvious challenge is that we have a very mediated experience of our research participants. So we observe them as they directly engage with this, but then it can be very hard to establish connections in this informal and casual way that sometimes the physical field offers, right? So you go in a physical field and you make a comment about the weather, you compliment a t-shirt that someone is wearing. Um, these things are very hard, but I also would argue not impossible to replicate in a virtual field. On the flip side, it's something that my students called lurking, which I think is the very apt um, name for it, because we can do this online lurking that would be completely impossible in a physical setting. So before we enter the field as researchers, we can get to know the rules and the modes of engagement of a community long before we join it, uh, which is kind of a luxury. Like imagine being able to observe your field site without everyone knowing for a while. Then you enter the field and you kind of know how to talk, you know how to join, you know who's the voice that you should be listening to. Um, you know all these things. So that's a great advantage. But one of the key challenges that I want to address because I 
for digital ethnographers and probably the one that I hear my students encountering the most is just dealing with the sheer amount of data um, that is available in their online fields. So even after they select a field and they find a platform and they even find a topic, then there's always the moment of, okay, what now? Because there are hundreds of posts, hundreds of conversations, so many connections across communities. So how do I make sense of it? Um, and again, I think this is where qualitative data analysis software can really help. Uh, and it can make a difference in the way that we approach the field because it offers a way to manage and to organize and then analyze this overwhelming amount of data without compromise, compromising on the nuance of the qualitative data analysis part. And I know if I'm speaking to ethnographers here, I know that there is always some resistance at the thought of relying on this analysis software for ethnography. And my personal response to that, like again, it's my just my opinion, but I think in part that is two things. One is a bit of over romanticization of the ethnographer, um, but the other is also an undeserved mistrust for software. So what I hope to show you in the rest to the intuition of the ethnographer um, is just trying to provide a way for the ethnographer to organize and keep track of their thoughts and inspirations in the field. So it's simplifying the process of both data collection and analysis. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. It's Christina, yeah. sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. So I wondered whether if you might turn off your video so that we that might help uh, the audio a little bit, do you mind? Absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Sorry, my Italian connection comes and goes sometimes. I let me know. Let me know and feel free to, to jump in if I'm breaking up again. Perfect. Will do. Thanks, Kate. All right, no problem. So in terms of like a few practical examples, so what I will do right now, I will rely particularly on the qualitative data analysis software that I know the most at Max QD 2020. Um, but a lot of what I will cover is stuff that I hope is translatable across platforms and across softwares. Um, and I would very much like to um, talk about two media sites in particular. So uh, one is Twitter and one is YouTube. I picked those in part because MaxQDA is optimized for these, uh, in part because they're two of the most popular ones that I've seen in my classes. Uh, even though I do know that TikTok is on the rise, but I think software has not caught up with TikTok yet. So uh, for now, we're going to Twitter because this is a social media that already recognizes the data volume problem that they have. And so much so that they then, even before researchers have to start coding. Um, and this system is, of course, the hashtag. So if, if you think about it, the hashtag is a user generated code. Um, and it says a lot about the meaning making process of a virtual community on Twitter. So for an ethnographer, the hashtag is an invaluable starting point for their analysis because users are already doing some of the coding that we're trained to do. That's awesome. Um, so on MaxQDA, it's possible to start with the hashtag um, in order to import Twitter data into the project. Um, and this is what I did in the screenshot. So right here, you can see that the hashtag that I picked was academic Twitter because we cannot escape our academic life. Um, and you can also use other elements to select relevant data. So you can use keywords, um, you can use phrases, you can use specific authors. Um, keep in mind if you're using this program that all these are interpreted as end functions. So if you use a lot of them, the number of results that you're going to have is going to shrink by a lot. Um, so, and then Twitter has all these rules for import, so they only allow things for the previous week, which to an ethnographer, that is not an issue though. Um, because if you think about it, you do want to be there in the moment. You want to be in the field as things happen. And this just this is what a program helping to get all that data on a project where you can analyze it. Um, but ideally, you want to be in the field as things are happening. So the system of starting with a hashtag, um, to me, is a great way to start getting a sense of the virtual field um, and to narrow it down through other recurring hashtags that come that happen in combination with the first one. So here's what happens at the program level. The program asks you if you want to then select other hashtags to autocode. 
So that means that the program identifies other hashtags that are happening uh, within the tweets that you select. So here in this example, I just picked the first seven um, because they were the ones that were recurring the most. Um, so after I pressed OK right there, I could also have selected authors, but I, I decided not to because I felt that was not the right thing for this type of analysis because I was more interested about the way that all the users around um, define their community and how they decided which hashtags to use. So by auto-coding this, um, you then get codes automatically added to the segments depending on the hashtags that they used. And I will show you what this looks like in practice. So this is my MaxQDA screen after I imported this, um, this data. So I have a max of 10,000 tweets, so that's what I have. And they are all divided right here in my document um, in, the, in my document system. So every single one of these is a table that has a thousand rows. So each row is one tweet. Um, this is what the data looks like right here. Um, so as you can see, I have codes that have been attached already to the tweets. Uh, and then this doesn't show the whole column, um, but there are a lot of information, including the author, the location of the author, their profile description, the number of followers that they have, the number of tweets, whether their profile is very for an ethnographer is so vital to understand the state of the field. Um, and as you can see right here, I have my coding system with the codes and the hashtags that I've selected. So as you can see, though, this is data to deal with because I guess it's good that it's coded, but it's still 10,000 tweets that I don't plan on reading because that's that's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so on the analysis side of things, programs like MaxQDA can help the researcher with specific functions. So one specific function that I want to show is the one that is helpfully called the Twitter data analysis of MaxQDA. Um, and the way that it works is after going on analyze and click on analyze tweets, um, this is what you see. So you get all your tweets right here. Um, and then on the left side, you can select options um, and you can filter tweets using any of the options right here. So by doing that, you already have a sense of what kind of thing seems to be important in the community um, and to see things in color and possibly in graph forms, you can actually do that and create graphs that tell you a number of things. So. These are some examples of the graphs that I've created um, just to make sense of these tweets. And for an ethnographer, like if you think of this from the perspective of a digital ethnographer, this is key to gain an understanding of the boundaries around a particular community. You know, that thing that I was struggling with in my own community being like, okay, how do I define it? How do I make it community sized? And how do I tell someone here's where it starts and here's where it ends? Um, this can help. And there are also details that can into the field, right? So if you were doing research on academic Twitter, um, it seems that Monday is the day to be in the field because that's where most of the tweets happen. Um, and Wednesday is not a great day to be in the field. I don't know what happened on Wednesday. Um, but there seems to be a, a very clear pattern right here. Um, and also, it seems to be a community that retweets a lot uh, and does not reply, um, which to me is already telling me something about the modes of engagement. So if I were an ethnographer going into this field, the first thing I would start doing is I would start retweeting. Um, I would not start replying to tweets because that's not how members of the community engage. So things like that can really help. Um, and you can also see here like the most frequently used hashtags. So that helps figuring out where the community communicates. And like if you were to build almost like a network analysis of communities talking to each other, you can see that with the cross hashtagging of things. So. This is already, to me, a great way for an ethnographer to get a sense of the field. Um, and then one last thing that I want to mention on the Twitter analysis side of things is that within that same window for Twitter analysis right here, there is also an option um, to run a sentiment analysis. So this basically tells MaxQDA to run a sentiment analysis and the program assigns a sentiment score to each tweet um, from positive to negative, and it comes up with the option um, to create charts that are based on the results of those analyses. So I think right now I had selected things that mentioned students 
and I wanted to see how the academic community talked about students. And it's lovely to see that most of them were slightly positive um, or neutral. Um, there's not a lot of negative talking about students, which is a lovely thing to see in the academic community every now and then. So things like that, again, they're not substituting for the ethnographer, but they can tell the ethnographer where to go look. Um, and then they can really inform the analysis after you get there. So it helps to discern patterns. It can help inform the coding. Uh, it can help inform the engagement with the field. So this is, I think, a good way to deal with a lot of content. Um, now with the next social media site that I want to talk about, we have a different problem because this site has both a lot of content, but on top of that, it's content that takes a variety of forms. So if you have to think like ethnographers and think, okay, how do we treat the YouTube community as a site for ethnographic observations? And I would argue that there are three levels at which researchers can direct their analysis. So they can do, they can focus on the video themselves, right? Looking at the audiovisual content, and this would include background music, it would include setting, um, it would include like everything from photography to the, the tiny details uh, that are visual or audio. Or they can focus on the transcript. So that would be just like what the person says. Um, and then of course, they can focus on the comment section because that's where a lot of the community building happens. Um, and that is the site for synchronous communication and interaction. And this would be like a synchronous or quasi-synchronous communication type. Um, and meaning making, of course, happens at all levels. Um, so in this case, what I use QDA software for is as a tool that allows me to make sense of this complexity and it allows for the simultaneous analysis of all of these levels. So going into the practice of it, and how do we do that? How do we combine all these levels? Um, also, um, if you have attended the conference Max Days 2021, forgive me for a bit of repetition in the visuals here because I'm using the same screenshots because I really like them because um, that's the, what I use for my YouTube analysis. So bear with me on that level. Um, so on Max QDA, it's possible to import data um, from the virtual field of YouTube. Um, in this case, using import YouTube data as a sequence of clicks. So this makes this window that I'm showing appear. Um, and as you can see, you can paste the link into the YouTube from the YouTube video that you want to you want to analyze uh, right here at the top. And then the software will retrieve key pieces of information for you. Um, and right below the link, you will see the video information, which includes the number of comments um, that then that are on the video at the time of download. Uh, it signals the presence of a transcript or closed captions when they're available. And then when you import the comments, you have the option to auto-code them, which I highly recommend. Um, if you select the option, the program will automatically generate codes that indicate how many replies each comment generated. And you can see that you can also decide to only import top-level comments. Um, what this means is that you will only get comments that are just comments, like if the first person that comments and writes something and not the replies. Um, so I left it unchecked because I think to study YouTube communities ethnographically, you do want that interaction, so you want to see everything. So as a result of my choice, the autocode, and I will show you in a second, included two different subcodes, one that was comment at the top level with X number of replies, and the other one that was called reply to comment. So the system puts them in two different coding categories so that you can retrieve them differently. And then in addition to the comments, if the video includes a transcript or closed captions, um, you can choose to import those. And you can further choose to include times in the transcript. And this is an option that if I have, I always check um, because whenever you're analyzing a comment, inevitably there is someone mentioning a specific time in the video that they're talking about. So having those links and having those times already embedded in the transcript, um, that saves me a lot of time because I don't have to go and manually link things and I can go and retrieve those segments. So highly recommend it if you have the transcripts. And then lastly, you can link the transcript to the actual video file. Um, this is a little bit tricky because you have to have the YouTube video saved as a video file on your computer. And every few months or few years, YouTube changes um, the platform so that it gets harder and harder to do so. But there are always ways to get uh, the video down to your computer. So depending on your situation, you might have it. Um, if you do, this is an optimal situation for an ethnographer because you can add the file here and then tell the program to upload 
the file to the project and link it to everything else that you have. So it would be directly linked to the transcript. So why am I saying that this system to import data helps an ethnographer to move from observation to analysis? Um, well, the reason I'm saying that is because there are a number of things that happen when you click on that import uh, YouTube video, YouTube data button. Um, so the first thing that happens is that the program creates a new folder um, that has an attached memo, and we'll talk about memo in a little bit. Um, and the memo includes the video title, the author, the URL, the posting date, the description, and the numerical data. Um, so all this is stuff that as an ethnographer you want to have handy. You want to know what, what this video was about. You want to know how to retrieve it if you haven't saved it. You want to know everything you can about this video because it makes up that word that you're studying. And then the other thing that happens is comments are saved um, in separate documents in the folder and they're arranged just like the Twitter data in tables that contain up to a thousand comments um, per table. And then the table columns, exactly like for Twitter, include all these relevant comment data, uh, the author's username, the author's URL, if they have a YouTube video, a YouTube channel, um, when they post it, and the number of likes and replies that they received. And then, as I mentioned, each comment is coded by a number of replies received. And then the timestamp transcript is saved as a separate document. So with one click, you basically have half of this word is right there. Um, it's one video, so it's, it's going to be part of a bigger word probably. but that is a lot of data you get fairly easily. Well, if you think about just spending time in the field and taking notes on a notepad, as I used to do, um, that makes things a little bit more complicated because you're keeping track of so many things at once. Um, so I know that what I'm listing here is a lot. So let me show you what this looks like. Um, again, with the, a screenshot of what happens, this is the my max qda window after i've imported everything um after i've imported this video so right here i have again um my documents so i have this time we didn't go to ten thousand. we had little, little under two thousand comments we only have two tables um and then this is the video file and the transcript because they were linked together and then right here you can see the two levels of coding um of codes that i had that I mentioned previously. So this one is the top level comment with X number of replies, and these are all the replies. So if at some point of my analysis, I don't want to deal with the replies, I can always just run the analysis on this by um, highlighting this uh, and by activating just those tweets. And then here we have a very similar table compared to the Twitter table that we've seen before. Um, right here, we have like the number. Um, I also very much like that the number is this way, that where like five is the fifth comment and then the comment below is called by one because it's a reply and it's not a new comment. So this is how to deal with um, And as you can see, we have the author and the author's URL right here. Um, and this basically tells the ethnographer, here's what you have. Here's the parts of the words that you're observing. What do you want to do with it? Uh, which is a, a pretty scary question, right? What do we do with this data? Um, I have a few options for you to talk about. So one thing is to focus on the comments, for example, right? So at the comment level, um, there are possibilities where you can code manually the various contributions uh, and then run a thematic analysis of it. So what are these people talking about in the comments? Um, this is fun to do with YouTube, particularly if you have both the video, the transcript, and the comments, because there are some communities where those three things are aligned. And then there are communities where you look at the comment section and you could never be able to guess what the video is about just based on the comments. So sometimes those things are completely separated from each other. And there's a lot of, of analysis to do there. And there's a lot of, um, of just interesting social happening. Um, for an ethnographer to, to analyze. So the other option that I see my students taking a lot is look at word frequencies. So just to define like the discursive um, vocabulary of, of a community. Um, and you can check for patterns, um, identify relevant topics of conversation with that system. And then because of the way that, that the program automatically codes and signals comments that are linked together, um, it's helpful to look at comment chains, right? Look at the comments that produce a lot of engagement and then try to figure out why, like what, what was it about it that made people want to reply to it. And then of course you can order um, and activate the comments based on the likes and the replies to do that. So that, that makes it easy. 
right? If you imagine like the process of just trying to scroll down, uh, the thing that drives me mad about YouTube is that there never seems to be a clear system. Like it's not like the most liked comment always rises to the top. So having something that I can deal with on my side of things without having to deal with the way that YouTube's algorithm decides uh, to prioritize content, that helps. I think it helps a researcher a lot in that sense. So, and this is just on the comment side of things, right? On the video and transcript fronts, front, you also have a lot of options for coding. You have a lot of options for analysis. So you can choose to code on the transcript. Um, so that would be on the text. Or you can choose to code on the video file. So this is what I was doing in this screenshot right here. I was coding directly on the video file and on the audio track. Um, my students doing this had some fantastic analysis that were looking and the thematic overlap between the video content and the conversation happening. And that's where they found out that sometimes there's just no overlap whatsoever. Um, and then, of course, if you have the video file, you can expand the analysis. And an ethnographer could, for, for example, look at the aesthetic choices in the video, uh, look at the connection between these choices and then the textual content and things like that. Um, so from a data analysis standpoint, relying on software to analyze YouTube videos and comments allows for this deep ethnographic engagement with materials. Um, and at the same time, it invites and, and kind of facilitates the presence of a structure. Um, so I think that's a good combination that helps an ethnographer contextualize interactions because you can move back and forth between these data types. Um, so you never lose any of that, of that nice um, nuance that you have to qualitatively study the data, but you also have that lovely structure where you, like, you click around and you're able to find um, the, the data types that you need, and you're able to establish connections, and you're able to build nice graphs um, to show that. So in the time that I have left, before we move on to the q and I want to that to me is absolutely vital in the context of digital ethnographic practice um, and in the context of analysis of ethnographic data. So that aspect is the possibility of incorporating field notes um, and the practice of writing field notes into software assisted data analysis. So for doing this, I personally rely. I am, as an ethnographer, an obsessive note taker. Um, and I am of the opinion that when our field sites become virtual wards, there is a particular need for a field note system that is as flexible as that word, right? Because the field is fluid. Um, the field is online and it goes, as we've seen in YouTube, um, it goes all over the place. Like things happen all at once. So I need a, a system for field notes that is not just paper that allows me to move between. Just today is memos. Um, so what are memos in QDA software? Um, it, it varies slightly depending on the software, but in Max QDA, these are quite literal post-it notes. <laughs> that can be attached to text, document, document groups, videos, and codes, or they can just exist as free memos. Um, and I like them as a tool for ethnographic field notes because they allow you to observe and annotate the events that are happening in the field and then just literally sticking it to those events, right? You stick the notes right next to it. Um, I also use it a lot pedagogically because I find these are a tool to, to help them visualize the way that they're thinking about it. Um, and I've realized that it's also a great way for them to find out what they're actually interested in, right? Because you have so many options on where to put the notes and what to write notes about, that sometimes they come to me with, I have all this data, I don't know what I want to do. And I say, just write memos. And then they come back and say, oh, I write all my memos. And they were all about the structure of the video and the, and the interested in them. So if you want to try and use them with your students, highly recommend it because it really helps put your thought process into like concrete post-it notes that you attach to parts of a screen, which is amazing. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the notes and the memos are great for grounded theory. Um, but I mean, that's an easy thing to say also because I mean, grounded theory is, is a good friend of ethnographic practice. So of course they work for that. Uh, but they're also useful for a lot of other methodological approaches. So even if you start from theory, even if you're a heavily theoretical ethnographer, you can still use field notes um, to track down where you see theory appearing and whether you see patterns that depart from the theory that you expect to see happening. So 
don't discount it even if you're not a grounded theory person. Um, and then one thing that I will show you towards the end um, is that there is a way a max QDA memo manager, which is now my best friend as a digital ethnographer. So when I mentioned uh, we need a fluid and multifaceted system for note taking, here's what I meant. These are just the types of memos. It's a list of types of memos that you can create in max QDA and I'm sure in many other uh, QDA packages and other software. Thing that's in your project. Um, and then, of course, if you don't know where to put a memo, you can always just write a free memo and just let it float around. Um, so let me show you what a memo looks like. So this is a free memo. We can see that from the, tit the title here. So this is the title. It's titled Free Memo 1 because we're very original. Um, but you can change the title at any point. So in my defense, I would have probably changed it. So this is what the interface looks like. Um, and you can customize everything about it. You can customize the way that the post-it looks. So you can, you can choose one of these options. Um, and then you can link memo content to content within the document. That is one of the things that I love because sometimes I write and I'm like, well, this reminds me of that thing that has been said at this minute. And instead of just writing all that, I can just say, this reminds me of this thing. And then I link it to that moment. So whenever I look at my memos, when I print my memos, I can see what I was connecting it to. That I did before I use software. And it's usually like, oh yeah, I think this is a uh, similar to a thing that I've observed like two weeks ago. And then I have to go back and find the notepad that I was using two weeks ago. So this saves a lot of time. Um, it, particularly to someone like me that is not the most organized person when we're not talking software. So um, I highly, highly recommend you trying this. Um, so that's, we have only a couple of minutes because I want to leave room for a q and I just wanted to show you more in depth a couple of the memos that I have mentioned. Um, so these are the in-document memos. Um, this, them. Um, and once you do, basically you select a part of the text and then you write the memo. Um, and this is what it looks like once you have this little thing here, the memo sidebar. So the helpful thing about it is that one, I see that there is a memo attached to a segment. Um, and then with the memo sidebar, I can read it as it goes through my data. So I can see what I was thinking about as I was going through the text or through the tweets or through the comments. So I can always track my thought process and I can see where I was going with it. Um, and here I also have one that I've edited clearly when I was like, oh, now I realize this was a lot of engagement, but then most of the replies were pluses. So what is up with that? Um, so things that you have to learn, like the language of the community that you're observing, that's that's part of it. So uh, their counterparts to this are the in-media memos. Um, so these are the ones that are attached to the media file. Um, and to do this, you basically just click on this icon and then it gets attached to that file. Um, and I use this just to make notes about what I was seeing on screen and what I was hearing and whether there was something about it that I really wanted to uh, point out that felt relevant for that video. Um, and then, of course, you can check if then the comments notice that too. So this is the other option that I see my students and myself using a lot. Um, one last thing in this two minutes that we have. Um, this is the memo, the, the memo manager that I mentioned. Um, this is my new best friend because after I do all this note taking, after I do all this writing, um, then I have memos everywhere, usually. Then I have just a whole lot of post-its. Um, and I need a place to see them all. And I need to, a place to make sense of where I put them and what I wrote. Um, and then where I can edit them and just drag and drop and change things around. So this is basically if you had like the good old pen and paper, but you could change everything. Like in one of those sci-fi movies where you can change reality at your fingertips. That's basically it. Um, as you can see right now, I've ordered them by origin so I can see where these memos are, if they're code, if they're in document, if they're in media. So this is all they do and it's all there in one neat place that I can observe. Um, so that is why it is my new best friend. I'm very mindful of the time. I have one minute. I have just one last thing to tell you before I open for the Q&A. So, and what I want to tell you is that I do really hope that I have given you just a small taste of the potential that I see for QDA software as a tool to support ethnographers. 
as they embark in their project in the virtual field. Um, and digital ethnography as a method is evolving very, very quickly. And it's becoming more visible and to a certain extent is becoming mainstream as much as I dislike that term. Um, so I really hope that some of these practical applications of QDA software that we have seen will inspire you as you think about your current and future projects. So I want to thank you all for coming to this webinar and I think we'll now have a full 50 minutes of Q&A. I look forward to reading your questions and I will do my best to answer them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, that's uh, been a really very rich um, uh, presentation and kept beautifully to time. So thank you very much. That's a, a, a real skill as well. Um, you've managed to give us a real insight into your own practices in the use of this CACDAS tool um, and real uh, sort of snippets into how you use it, which is great. That's exactly what we're after in, uh, in, in this stream, in the user stream, um, and also given us kind of highlights of so many aspects of the, the, the software um, and how you and your students use it. So thank you so very much for that. Um, people have really been uh, uh, kind of interacting with the material. So I've got quite a lot of questions. Um, they kind of range from uh, asking for your opinion slash advice on um, aspects of individuals' work and their intentions around that. Um, and then also some technical uh, questions. We may not get to all of the questions. So anyone who's posted questions, don't feel bad if I don't cover them immediately here. If Kate's up for it, we will um, uh, pose all of them to her and she can then respond um, uh, and we can uh, include her responses in our follow-up email to you. Okay, so if I don't get to all of your questions, uh, then then that's just to do with however how many we've, we've got here. So, um, Kate, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a question from uh, Sonia. Um, and this kind of goes back to where you started, which was the idea of virtual worlds. So Sonia's asking, she says, I'm researching school websites um, and how they are used for cooperation with parents. Uh, and would you say that those are the virtual worlds? I would say that they could. Um, I think my question would be how much interaction is there, right? Um, because the, the thing that an ethnographer needs to, like it craves very much, um, is like see interaction on these websites. So if the school websites are mostly used where there is a school talking to the parents uh, and that's it, like there's no replies from the parents, there's no cooperation happening on the website, then they can be part of it. But then in order for it to be like the full virtual world, you would have to see that cooperation happening. So if you can have that side of the conversation for an ethnography, I think that would be necessary. Um, that said, you could still study that. It would not just be, it would not be an ethnography maybe, but you could definitely study the content, do like a qualitative content analysis and use a lot of the tools that I've shown to do that. Um, I do think like for, like if you want to present the that to like an ethnography journal or something like that, they would want to see that interaction and that, that synchronous communication between people. Mm. That's a really useful tip. Thank you very much. Um, so the uh, next question is from Patrick, and Patrick has asked them multiple questions in one question. So I'll um, uh, put them uh, to you uh, slowly. So um, uh, Patrick says, um, uh, for your own research in WeChat, did you use a CACDAS package? Uh, and how did you capture your data and approach analysis in that? Yes, so WeChat is uh, a wild beast because getting data from WeChat is a real pain. Um, so there are, you are right, there are no current uh, data analysis softwares that allow you to get get WeChat data the way that I did Twitter data and YouTube data. So I had to go through a whole process. I actually paid someone because I don't know how to do it. But someone had to scrape data from WeChat and then I got it. Um, in the form of Excel tables, and then I imported the Excel tables into Max QDA, and that's where I could run the analysis. But you are right that there are like a limited number of of platforms that are compatible uh, for like such an easy data access, data retrieval um, right now. Okay, so that the follow up from Patrick really was about sort of advice. Well, what do we do when we've got these platforms that are slightly less compatible with where the CACDAS packages are at at the moment? 
And so Kate has shared with us her experience and how she's um, uh, managed that with regards to WeChat. Uh, Patrick is also mentioning Instagram uh, and uh, TikTok mm -hmm. and any work around right. I of think those. Yeah. Yeah, Instagram, depending on the volume of data that you're interested in, like screenshots are always an option, but they do take some time. And then it really depends on whether you're in the situation where you can say like hire students to take a lot of screenshots and then incorporating them. Um, because uh, the photos would be a bit more of a problem possibly, but because Instagram also has like the web version of it, um, programs like MaxQDA and other QDA software, oftentimes they're optimized to download and scrape web pages. Um, so that could be an option. Open that on the web page. It's also something that I did on WeChat, but sometimes that wouldn't work and it would get like weird characters um, all over the place. But that's an option where you can get a lot of the text that way and it doesn't require any scraping skills. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that uh, what Kate has talked about um, also answers in part a question from Rim, who was asking, do you think that this work? Uh, could work with Instagram posts and stories and my PhD is based on YouTube and Instagram data and I'm having trouble analyzing those but I think um, Kate from what you've just discussed that's touching on on what Rin's asked there as well um, so I'll move on to uh, another question and this is a little um, possibly more technical so uh, you know Kate feel free to bat it back um, if uh, if if you haven't got the answers to it um, so for Max QDA, um, <clears throat> this is from Jer Jeremiah. So for Max QDA, QDA to access Twitter, um, there are searches restricted to the previous seven days. So Jeremiah popped up here. So maybe Jeremiah, you wanted to ask that question uh, yourself, unless you prefer me to continue. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Um, yes, I can ask it. So Sarah got part of the question there. Uh, it looks like it's limited. Max QDA searches are limited to the Twitter searches, which is the previous seven days or some number of tweets. Um, there are academic researcher uh, access that Twitter has has granted. We go through an application process. Do you know if Max QDA, if you can connect those access token keys to your academic researcher Twitter, so you can scrape a much broader sense of um, of Twitter for the searches? That was the first one, and then the second one had to do with the limit. It looks like Max QDA has a limit per table of ten thousand. Uh, observations, 10,000 rows. What do you do for a workaround when your data sets are much larger than that? Thank you, Sarah. Right. So, so for the first question, I'm not sure um, because they don't know if you, so the Max QDA gets things directly from your Twitter uh, account. So it's possible that if your Twitter account has a higher limit that it could work, but I am not quite sure. So you would have to check with them. Um, it would be lovely if you had. And in terms of, yes, so the 10,000 observations is for downloads. So that's like what, what you get. But if you do it multiple times, so if I do it one week and then the next week I have another 10,000, then it's fine because you just have X number of, of tables with 1,000 row each. Yeah, so you're having to go in and kind of harvest at shorter intervals, perhaps, if your, your data points yeah. are greater than 10,000. Yeah, excellent. That's great. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, we definitely found that the interconnection between the Cactus packages and these other platforms is also often changing um, based on the regulations, both between Twitter, et cetera, and the package itself. So, um, you know, what can be said one week isn't necessarily the case the following because things are changing over time there. Yeah. OK, great. Um, there's a question around the sentiment analysis side of what you were talking about, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. So for for those present who are not as familiar with the, the sentiment analysis tool, there's a question around mm -hmm. who's doing that sentiment analysis. Um, uh, is it uh, the, the is it sort of artificial intelligence is the question? Is it is it kind of programming inbuilt into the software or uh, is there a kind of a human researcher behind it is the question. So the, the 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 first one when you hit like do the sentiment analysis, that's the program doing it, um, and it's the program picking up words and giving a score to those words. Which to me, as someone that studies discourse analysis, is particularly interesting because of course the thing that AI is not great at detecting is like irony. So sometimes we use words that would be like coded as a negative word, but really the, the overall meaning of the tweet is positive. 
Um, so there is that to look through, but at the first level of coding on, on big data sets, I find that it's very helpful to find it. Uh, because yes, there's probably going to be a lot of mistakes and a lot of things that the researcher would have to go back and, and change. Um, but in terms of giving like bird eye view of, okay, are these tweets overwhelmingly positive or overwhelmingly negative? That, that's a good sense, just based on the words that are used in the tweet. Yeah, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, as a follow on from that, and just to link back to a previous webinar that was um, run uh, uh, on this stream, um, Norman Pelladieu spoke uh, a little while ago about sentiment analysis in relation to cap sales packages. So that might be one of the recordings to return to if you're particularly interested in what's going on there. And, um, and, and Norman also spoke about what Kate's just said uh, to do with a kind of false positives, false negatives based on phrasing uh, and terms of phrase. So that might be a useful resource to, to, to loop back to. Um, uh, now we have a question to do with language. I don't know, uh, Kate, um, you uh, possibly work in, in, in multiple languages yourself. There's a question about whether Max PBA can identify languages other than English. So, for example, Chinese. Yes, the answer is yes, um, absolutely, which is pretty great. So I think it's optimized to both download data in multiple languages and analyze data in multiple languages. Um, I know, I think it's it, Chinese is included in the update. I, I would need to check because the last time that I checked, um, when I was doing my research, Chinese was still not optimized. Japanese was optimized. So the probably Chinese that had to first run all my data through a software that would segment it. Because otherwise, the, the thing with Chinese is that programs that are just character based, they cannot identify where a word ends and where the other one begins. So if they either count every single character, so they miss words that are multiple characters, or they segment it incorrectly. So uh, Stanford has this like open uh, source system to do this. Um, it just requires a little bit of, of, of being a nerd, I guess, um, or having friends who are, who are nerds enough to that they can run your data through it. That's what I did because I, I tried it and uh, failed miserably at my first two attempts. And then I emailed a friend and he was kind enough to do it for me. So I, I recommend mm -hmm. trying it though. <laughs> and then uh, having those sorts of friends, excellent. Thank you, Kate. Um, I have one or two more questions, uh, kind of shame, uh, shamelessly, they, they come from me, um, because we managed to cover most of the questions from, from the group. Um, one is to do with, uh, so we're looping back to the idea of uh, virtual worlds, um, and your definitions at the beginning I found were really helpful, so as places, um, and they have a sense of worldness. Um, and I was just wondering um, what happens when people navigate through the different worlds with different levels of adeptness um, and kind of with different intentions or um, uh, I suppose needs um, in those spaces and how does this affect the ethnography um, and our responsibilities as researchers towards the members of the of, of, of these worlds? Yeah, absolutely. That is actually something that I've been thinking about a lot because partly because we have to transition online, but also partly because of how new everything is about digital ethnography or how new everything feels about digital ethnography. There has been a little bit of, oh, wow, we can reach everyone and the word is at our fingertips. And this is just not true. Um, so there are a lot of exclusions that we have to keep in mind as ethnographers when we go in the digital field and thinking about whose voices are we really hearing? Uh, of course, the populations, like on certain, like if you do an ethnography of TikTok, you're going to capture a lot of young voices. Um, and then depending on your field sites, like if you're working with a very remote community with little access to the internet, it's very hard to think of a digital ethnography that can be truly like representative of the community itself. So mm -hmm. I think as ethnographers, like we do have um, an ethical duty of acknowledging what are we, what exactly are we capturing in the data? And we are capturing a particular community that may have the privilege of being online. But then you're also right, like you're making me think that even within communities that are online, there's going to be very different levels of engagement and very different abilities and even just very different languages that are being used whenever someone types um, and is like a, a regular user or it's someone that just casually uses the app. Um, and I think that is part of of what makes ethnography great for these things because mm -hmm. that's how you capture these individuals that's how you yeah. get 
their experience. That's how you manage to see how they interact with each other. Um, so I think, I think it's feasible. Um, it just requires ethnographers to never forget that they, there is, there are still um, things that are happening online that reflect disparities in the in the in the physical world. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, it touches on something that Suman uh, has asked. Who's doing a, a, a an ethnography, ethnography of a of a very remote um, uh, community um in the himalaya and so i'll put that to you separately if you're okay um with that kate because we've come up against yeah. time so if it's okay suman i'll send your question to kate and she can see whether she can get back with any um particular suggestions around that um so i think that we are kind of come to the um to the end of our uh time together so i'm going to uh uh, thank Kate um, again uh, very, very much for uh, her time and thank everybody for uh, their engagement. It's just been uh, such a pleasure uh, to be with you all today um, and uh, and to cover this ground and uh, a, a really excellent last webinar to our series. Um, thanks everyone for being here with us over this year. It's been a really fabulous um, trial of something kind of uh, a bit new. And it's worked out really well um, and uh, that's largely thanks to excellent presenters including Kate as well as um, everyone who's attended and been part of our conversations. So we wish you the very very best over the, the, the next few months over the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere and we um, really look forward to seeing you in September for some more uh, engagement. So thank you so much Kate, thanks everybody for being here and uh, keep well, keep safe and hope to see you very soon. Okay, bye. Kate. Bye,